Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the 41st annual Winter Lecture Series, Global Perspectives. This year's theme is Can Democracy Be Saved? The Global Trend Towards Strongman Rule. I am Peter Levitoff, Chair of the Planning Committee. Other members of the committee are Dick Deanspear, Chad Edsaith, Chuck and Barbara Francis, David Forsyth, John Comer, and Parks Coble. Bob Fusen will oversee the technical aspects of the Zoom delivery of the series. By the way, we'll use the same Zoom link for all four lectures. Across the globe, we see many countries displaying some version of liberal democracy, but then gradually yielding to strongman rule. Incidentally, to date, there has not been an instance of strong woman rule. We ask how and why this can occur in genuine, genuine democracies. We want to know about successful recovery. Today, and for the following three weeks, we look at four countries that can be discussed within this framework. Hungary, Brazil, Turkey, and India. To help us understand and guide us through this phenomenon, we have a distinguished group of speakers from across the country, several of whom are natives of the countries they will address. Let me brief, briefly outline our four sessions. Uh, today, February 18th, Professor Zoltan Barani of the University of Texas will speak on Hungary. Next week, February 25, Professor Wendy Hunt, Hunter, also of the University of Texas, will speak on Brazil. The following week, March 3rd, Professor Zera Arat of the University of Connecticut will speak on Turkey. And in our final session, March 10th, Professor Ashutosh Varshney of Brown University will speak on India. As has been the case for more than 20 years, the Winter Lecture Series is sponsored by the Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. The program is brought to you with financial support from Humanities Nebraska, a statewide nonprofit organization helping Nebraskans explore what connects us and makes us human. Additional support has been provided by the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. If you enjoy this type of programming, please consider supporting Humanities Nebraska with your contribution. We also partner with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, known familiarly as OLLI, which aids us with publicity by weekly email announcements to its more than 1,400 members, putting the winter lecture series at its course schedules and mentioning it in classes. Please consider the numerous OLLI classes offered over the five terms each year. And in fact, most people on the planning committee for the series are OLLI members. For information, including the catalog of current and forthcoming courses, go to OLLI at unl.edu. That's O-L-L-I at, at unl.edu. As you think of questions or comments, please put them in the chat function. At the end of each lecture, questions and comments will be taken from the chat. If the chat moderator, Bob Fusen, deems it appropriate, you may be able to ask or comment live by unmuting your microphone. Bob will let you know about this at the end of the lecture. We expect this session and the subsequent three sessions to end at 8.30, a 90-minute program. If you miss a lecture, each will be posted within a week or so on the Unitarian Church YouTube channel which you can find at www.youtube.com slash Unitarian Church of Lincoln with no periods, all one word, Unitarian Church of Lincoln. If you're not already on the list to receive winter lecture series reminders, 
you can go to the series website, which is www.unitarianlincoln. There's no word church in there. Unitarianlincoln.org slash winter hyphen lecture hyphen series. Now, please check and be sure you're muted and your video is off so full bandwidth can be given to the speaker. And on with the show. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce Professor David Forsyth from UNL, Emeritus Professor of Political Science, who will introduce the series and tonight's speaker. David, it's yours. Thank you, Peter. And thanks for your role in helping to organize this series. Uh, we appreciate your considerable efforts. Um, Peter has already given a nice description of the series that was chosen for this year, uh, Can Democracy Be Saved? There is a solid consensus out there in the real world that genuine democracy is under stress, under attack, indeed in decline. You can call it genuine democracy. You can call it full democracy. You can call it liberal democracy. Uh, it goes by different names, but it's all about combining free and fair elections, majority or plurality rule uh, with defense of human rights. That's what we mean by full democracy, genuine democracy, liberal democracy, uh, whatever you want to call it. I don't want to take up a whole lot of time on the general pattern, the general trend, but it's there. Freedom House is a private organization in New York, which has been tracking civil and political rights for a long time. And it has concluded that uh, free societies have been in decline for 15 consecutive years. Free societies, genuine democracies, uh, open societies, again, um, it goes by different names. But the global pattern is clear. The Economist magazine has a research unit called the Intelligence Unit, and it uses uh, four categories to talk about political systems in the world. Full democracy, flawed democracy, uh, partial autocracy, and full autocracy. It too finds a great decline in full democracy. Uh, it may be of interest to our audience to note that the United States is regarded as a flawed democracy, inferior to Canada, the Scandinavian states, and Western Europe. It notes a radical decline of full democracy in uh, the Sahel region of Africa, in parts of Latin America, and elsewhere. Uh, but the uh, status of democracy in the United States itself is certainly subject to discussion and debate. This series always focuses on some type of global subject. It takes a global perspective, and therefore we are gonna look at uh, four countries as Peter has already indicated. Uh, but in the back of all of our minds, I suspect, is what does all of this say about the United States itself? Are there lessons learned from looking at Hungary and Brazil, and Turkey, and India, that might give us some insights into our own country here in the United States. As Peter has already indicated, uh, we're gonna start with uh, Hungary and its longtime leader, Viktor Orban, and uh, help us understand the situation there. Uh, we are delighted to be able to listen to Zoltan Barani, Frank C. Irwin Jr. Centennial Professor of Government at the University of Texas at Austin. It was a, 
a genuine pleasure for me to review his resume and say to myself, wow, there's a former student who's done really, really well. Uh, Zoltan uh, did his undergraduate studies at Carleton in Canada. He then came to UNL political science and did his master's. And then he went on to the University of Virginia where he took his PhD in 1991. He is an internationally recognized expert on democratization, particularly civil military relations. Uh, he's a well-known scholar on those subjects. In fact, he has been elected to the Council on Foreign Relations, which some of you may know is uh, an establishment um, collection of experts, an established uh, think tank uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, he is the author of, single author of eight books, working on another one uh, at the moment. Uh, mainly having to do with national security, uh, the role of armies and defense forces, uh, including uh, NATO, for example. He's uh, edited uh, at least six books, including one entitled, Is Democracy Exportable? Very relevant to our topic tonight. He uh, has published too many refereed journal articles to count, so I didn't try to count them. Uh, and he is well published in major journals, for example, like the Journal of Democracy. Uh, he has a whole long list of accomplishments. A bit tongue-in-cheek, I was uh, very impressed to read that at the University of Texas at Austin, he served on the committee handling parking and traffic appeals. <laughs> so I, I thought that was quite uh, remarkable. Uh, right next to that, uh, he was uh, also honored as uh, being named uh, Admiral, Admiral, Admiral of the Texas Navy. This is a bit like being appointed to a leadership position in the Nebraska Navy. So he has uh, some major accomplishments uh, like that on his resume, but uh, more seriously, he's quite a distinguished scholar, and I will close this introduction uh, where I should have started by saying that he's a native of Hungary, and he takes a special interest in understanding the politics of Hungary and its strongman leader, uh, Viktor Orban. So, Zoltan, uh, it's great to see you again, and thanks so much for agreeing to be with us tonight. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to try to share the screen. And it's working. Yes. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you. Uh, always an honor to be asked to uh, talk to people who are not necessarily an academic audience. And uh, in the next... Uh, 45 to 55 minutes or so, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, uh, perhaps illuminate the uh, situation in Hungary, what Orban has done to uh, achieve the distinction of being included in this lineup of uh, modern uh, autocrats. And uh, just as importantly, why does he continue to be elected? Uh, because he is continuing to be elected, and even though the political uh, playing field is not uh, un not fair, to be sure, but just like Putin and some of the other uh, autocrats, he would still be elected even if it were fair, uh, as I will ex expand a little later. Uh, let me just start with uh, just a very basic uh, introduction to Hungary. And uh, so this is um, obviously a Central European country. It is It has 10 million people. The uh, land mass of Hungary is roughly uh, 
36,000 square miles and uh, almost exactly the size of the state of Indiana. And uh, it uh, doesn't have a great deal of natural resources, but uh, historically it has been uh, uh, sort of a, a Central European country that is uh, uh, more developed than uh, its neighbors to the east and the southeast, but not nearly as developed as uh, Slovenia, which you can see a tiny bit. Uh, it is being uh, uh, bordered on Hungary, uh, which is uh, by far the most uh, prosperous post-socialist country. And uh, the Czech Republic, which you can also peek a bit of it on the on the right left uh, on the on the top right of your screen, which it does not share a border with Hungary. Of course, it did when uh, it was still a part of Czechoslovakia until 1993. So uh, Budapest, of course, is the uh, this is a highly centralized country. Budapest has more than 20 percent of the population, so it's. Uh, over 2 million uh, people, and I think the, the, the second largest city, so you have a little on, a little uh, uh, compar basis from comparison is Mishkolz up there, is an industrial city that has fallen on harder times uh, in the post-socialist uh, era, and uh, that its population is less than a quarter million. So, so Budapest is almost uh, 10 times as big as the next, as the second uh, largest city in, in Hungary. So here is Viktor Orban, uh, and this is, he was born in 1963, so he is going to be only 61 years old uh, this year. And he was uh, one of the founding leaders of this late communist uh, uh, era's uh, opposition uh, uh, groups. Hungary did not have uh, major opposition groups like Solidarity in in Poland that I'm sure many of you are aware of, or uh, Czechoslovakia uh, also had uh, uh, very <clears throat> extensive uh, opposition activity. Hungary did not. And part of the reason is that uh, you could travel out of Hungary after 1964. Uh, basically anyone who did not have a criminal record and wanted to leave the country could which was a very smart sort of safety well from the, from the communist regime uh, in uh, allowing people who, who uh, sort of hated the regime and would have, would have been troublemakers if they had stayed, such as yours truly, were allowed to leave. And so uh, it is only in the late 1980s that some of these groups uh, become uh, well-established and his, uh, the one uh, that he was instrumental, he was not uh, sort of a side actor, but he was an instrumental uh, leader and founder of uh, the party, which is called uh, Young uh, Alliance of Young Democrats or Federation of Young Democrats. In another word, and it's uh, a, the Hungarian acronym is FIDESZ, F-I-D-E-E-S-Z, -E -E and that's how it is known. So he made himself uh, a name in the summer of 1989. This is still sort of the death throes of socialism when there was a massive uh, rally, opposition rally uh, in Hero Square in Budapest where uh, uh, he called uh, for the withdrawal of Soviet troops. And Soviet troops uh, occupied Hungary uh, after 1945 uh, continuously and uh, obviously uh, uh, was sort of a, ma a major uh, complaint and, and uh, uh, source of, of dissatisfaction uh, with the people. I should also say that traditionally Hungarians have been very anti-Russian and I could go back to the, uh, to the uh, War of Independence in 1848 and and uh, where it was with Russian help that uh, that the uh, uh, revolutionary uh, army was uh, was suppressed by the Habsburgs, and so um, this anti-Russian uh, theme is a is a continuing uh, theme in Hungarian history, which will be interesting uh, today when I'll talk about it a little bit at the end of this. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> talk, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, uh, Orban was becoming quickly the leader, not just one of the leaders, but the leader of this of this party. He represented the party uh, at the uh, at the roundtable uh, discussions in 1989 that basically uh, uh, hammered out the uh, the framework for an orderly and peaceful transition to uh, what we hoped was going to be, and for a while was, democracy. So uh, just very briefly, uh, until uh, so 1990 to 1994, the first uh, post-communist government was a sort of center, center, center-right government. And uh, because of the heightened expectations, unreasonable expectations of people, uh, the that government uh, did not get reelected and was uh, uh, was uh, succeeded by a socialist government from uh, 1994 uh, to 1998. But in 1998, uh, Orban and Fidesz had their first uh, taste of being in power, and actually did rather well. Uh, at this point, they were not nearly as conservative as they are today, and. Um, and uh, it was probably their own sort of complacency that resulted in 2002 uh, in the loss of uh, uh, the elections for them and created the, uh, the possibility for another socialist government. And so this is uh, the socialist government uh, that, uh, that was, um, uh, elected and was in power for two uh, entire terms. It was uh, a disastrous, uh, everyone agrees that it was a, a disastrous uh, a government, particularly after the 2005-2006. Uh, it had some bad luck also with the, uh, with the uh, uh, international sort of economic crisis in 2007, 2008, 2009, but uh, it was, uh, its, it's uh, rule was uh, very much uh, reminiscent, especially in the second term of, um, of the socialist era. And so um, you know, massive corruption, this is also the, the period when Hungary, uh, Hungary joined NATO in 1999 under the first Orban government, but uh, it became a part of the EU uh, during this time, and uh, billions of euros uh, started to uh, enter the uh, bloodstream of the Hungarian economy, and uh, the corruption was absolutely rampant. And uh, there were protests, and the regime simply didn't know how to how to handle the protests in a sort of democratic way, and uh, uh, people were shot at with uh, with rubber bullets and so on and so forth. And uh, suffice it to say that by 2010, when the next elections happened, it was vastly unpopular uh, or unpopular, and so unpopular, in fact, that. Uh, Almost anyone would have been, according to the uh, according to the polls at the time, almost anyone would have been preferable to them. But this is when Orban comes back in 2010, and so he has been uh, in power. Uh, he and his uh, Fidesz in power uh, uh, since that time. So that's uh, 14 14 years. Okay, something is not happening here. Okay, this is. Yes, so uh, so Fidesz wins in uh, in uh, in uh, two uh, two thousand and ten, uh, and it's a massive win as you can as you can see on the sidebar, uh, and what is really important to understand that the reason why Orban could come to power with such a huge majority was the uh, terrible performance of, of its predecessor, of the, of the socialist, uh, socialist government. Uh, it would have never happened 
but uh, he, as a result, he was able to get this massive majority. And so uh, because of the disproportionate electoral law, but, and remember this disproportionate electoral law uh, already existed prior to him uh, to or, and Fidesz coming to uh, coming to power. It translated into uh, a 68 uh, percent uh, of the seats, so more than two thirds, which basically allowed him to and Fidesz to do pretty much uh, anything they wanted. The the sign in front of him says "It as idő," which means uh, this is the time or here is the time for uh, the new government. So Orban was uh, widely reported to have said more on more than one occasion that you only need to win big ones. And once you uh, big, uh, win big ones, uh, you get this over two thirds majority, which he did. And, uh, and he could basically rewrite the uh, constitution, the laws and so on, because these, most of these required a two thirds majority. So, uh, one of the things that uh, the this massive win allowed legally, uh, I should uh, underscore, Fidesz to do was to uh, amend the constitution uh, very extensively. Uh, the the super majority also allowed him to uh, uh, cut the size of the parliament in half which was actually broadly welcomed because the uh, parliament has uh, was way too large at 394 members. Remember that we're only talking about 10 million people and you can compare the uh, 340 million uh, Americans being represented in Congress by uh, only a little bit, like a third more representatives. So uh, in order to, to do this, to uh cut the parliament in in uh the size of the parliament in half this required redistricting uh the entire country and so the redistricting happened in a way that unsurprisingly was favoring fides uh they were uh fides uh, the young democrats were very well stocked with uh uh, social scientists and uh, people who knew exactly what they were doing, very uh, familiar with the country in terms of where the uh, pockets of conservatism and liberalism were, and so redistricted essentially uh, classic gerrymandering, as uh, many of us in the United States are uh, familiar with. So basically, uh, in 2010, already, uh, in the first term, after the two terms of uh, the socialist government, the first term of Fidesz was basically restructuring the state. Um, the uh, only way in this in this new system that the opposition could win would uh, essentially uh, be to join forces. And several opposition parties uh, join forces and and uh, and run together. Uh, now, what Fidesz also did uh, is to greatly uh, expand public sector employment, and uh, instead of uh, social welfare and unemployment benefits, public sector employment took their place. And so, by 2016, uh, into their second term the 5% uh, of the entire labor force depended on a, a local organization of Fidesz, which of course had uh, innumerable uh, local uh, chapters. So mayors were discretionarily awarding jobs. Another uh, very important way of, uh, of uh, creating a state that was dominated uh, by Fidesz uh, and uh, Orban was the creation in 2018 of the Central European Press and Media Foundation, but basically it was established by local oligarchs. Oligarchs, uh, generally people who, who uh, 
just like in Russia and other parts of the post-communist world, were able to uh, uh, monetize their uh, contacts with uh, existing uh, the privatization of, of former state companies and had become in, in many cases just uh, improbably fabulously wealthy. And some of these oligarchs uh, owned the newspapers. And so they basically donated uh, <laughs> about 500 uh, newspapers and journals and so on uh, to form this new uh, conglomerate. So the, uh, the media domination, of course, allows Fidesz to uh, uh, essentially uh, dominate uh, most of the print media, uh, although there are still, it's not entirely like Russia uh, in terms of there are still some major uh, journals, but they are generally speaking pitched to intellectuals. So there is, uh, for instance, uh, a very uh, readable and uh, and uh, balanced uh, journal that uh, is uh, very critical of Orban. This is uh, all, it was modeled when it it was when it first uh, uh, was published in the late uh, 1970s, early 1980s, uh, on the Economist, uh, the uh, the weekly. Uh, the weekly magazine uh, that uh, Dave Forsythe mentioned. Uh, so basically, uh, most of the people who are not intellectuals are almost entirely reliant on state media. And state media is, of course, owned by Orban and Fidesz. So this allows uh, the government, the Fidesz government, to um, uh, essentially conduct smear campaigns against the opposition uh, state, just uh, uh, straight out lies about uh, opposition. So for instance, in this last uh, uh, 2022 elections, uh, the, uh, the media suggested, not suggested, but essentially accused the, uh, the opposition of, uh, of wanting to send Hungarian soldiers to, uh, to the Ukraine. Uh, and uh, in order to fight uh, for Ukraine against uh, Russia, which of course could not have been farther from the truth, but the uh, uh, state media did not give uh, enough space for the opposition to refute these lies. So the most uh, recent, this is uh, just last year, uh, uh, tool of, of crushing dissent for, uh, for the um, Orban government was the Sovereignty Protection Act, which is uh, modeled uh, upon the Russian equivalent that Putin uh, already brought in about 10 years ago. And it is essentially to, uh, to limit whatever, uh, whatever foreign help uh, or assistance or donations uh, Hungarian opposition parties could get. And uh, so they are harassed uh, or their contribution, any kind of contribution or donation would be uh, scrutinized. And um, this uh, is uh, part of the campaign that started with uh, uh, the smearing of George Soros, the uh, Hungarian American uh, financier who, uh, established the Central European University, which uh, has been uh, for 25 years or 30 years probably now, uh, headquartered in Budapest. Uh, but uh, the government, the, the Orban government, because of the uh, great deal of criticism that scholars uh, leveled against the Hungarian state, uh, actually, uh, the social science departments were basically forced to uh, to relocate to Vienna uh, several years ago. So Hungary also has very contentious uh, relations with the EU and NATO, which is is uh, uh, sort of a fascination to many, given that uh, Hungary is a big. Uh, 
uh, beneficiary of uh, certainly of the uh, European Union, but it has been blocking EU uh, financial aid for Ukraine, for instance, most, more recently. Basically, uh, the, I think the Economist recently called uh, uh, Orban a cantankerous troublemaker and uh, a, a sort of a, a bomb thrower within the EU. Um, unfortunately, from uh, uh, many people's perspective, neither the EU nor NATO has a kind of uh, uh, mechanism, expulsion mechanism, or, or ways to enforce, uh, especially NATO, uh, <clears throat> sanctions against uh, member countries. And so, for instance, uh, very recently, just this last week, finally, the EU found a way to circumvent uh, Hungary's uh, blocking of uh, 50 billion euros of aid for uh, the Ukraine. And uh, whereas uh, Hungary's opposition to Sweden's uh, application to join NATO for reasons that are unclear, probably because uh, uh, Swedish Liberal Democrats have uh, been vocal um, critics of uh, the Hungarian government. So basically, Hungary has been blocking the uh, uh, Sweden's application. And just today, uh, it's in the New York Times that uh, American senators, a group of a delegation of American senators went to Budapest to talk to uh, uh, Hungarian uh, politicians about the alliance and uh, and the Hungarians snubbed them. They would not meet with them. So um, this is basically Hungary's uh, relationship with EU and NATO. So obviously, just like all these countries, when uh, they they could not wait to get into either of these international organizations, but once they were in. They almost, uh, well, it was, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, really interesting how, so for instance, when you join NATO, as many of you know, uh, NATO has a guide uh, line of uh, countries paying 2% uh, of their GDP on defense, so they wouldn't be free riders. And as soon as Hungary got in in 1999, if I remember correctly, the next year, the uh, Hungarian defense budget went under 1% and continued to stay there for, for many years. So this is, uh, uh, these are, uh, if not NATO and EU, who are Hungary's friends? Well, here, here you see the cast of characters. A couple of them you will be hearing more about. So there he is with uh, uh, the pantheon of of uh, dictators. So there is uh, Xi Jinping on the upper left, Putin, who uh, uh, Orban has been a close ally of, which is really interesting and and uh, makes people have uh, uh, when you ask them how you could how a Hungarian leader could be friends with a Russian dictator. Uh, uh, the many, many supporters of, of Orban cannot really come up with uh, with any convincing uh, answer. And there is Ordeg uh, Erdogan on the uh, top right and Bolsonaro on uh, the remaining, the last picture. I tried to find a picture for you uh, with Orban and Modi, but... Uh, but I don't think they ever met. At least uh, if they have, then there is no uh, pictorial evidence of it. So um, he's friends with all the wrong people, uh, has been uh, lots of, uh, has had lots of uh, interactions with, uh, with uh, uh, various dictators in Central Asia and uh, has uh, been, uh, <clears throat> Uh, sort of fashioning himself and suggesting that he was building an alternative to the Western approach, quote unquote. And, and his idea is broadly that the West is in decline and Asian and South American countries uh, represent the future. Uh, and uh, one might suggest that this kind of approach, uh, building relations with autocrats 
which underscores his quest for foreign investment with very little accountability. So in 2023, 20, uh, for instance, uh, there was an unprecedented foreign direct investment in Hungary, which exceeded 13 billion euros, uh, which le led to the record of 19,000 jobs created. Uh, so remember, this is only a country of, of uh, 10 million people. So 13 billion euros and, and 19,000 jobs uh, is a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous achievement. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the regime cannot stop uh, advertising uh, this uh, achievement itself. So uh, he is also hosting and friends with basically far right figures from you know Italy's uh, uh, Prime Minister Giorgio Maloney, the uh, the sort of a right wing fringe from France and Austria and, and so on and so forth. So this is. Um, the most recent uh, 2022 elections, uh, this slide. And uh, so the uh, perhaps it doesn't take uh, much explanation if you look at look at the these electoral the electoral poster and uh, up uh, on top it says this is the question. Uh, it's it's your turn to choose, and it refers to an, an old Hungarian revolutionary poem. But you see, the elector, uh, the uh, the opposition candidate, uh, in with the background is uh, the Ukraine war, and it says uh, war, whereas uh, uh, behind Orban's uh, picture is the very uh, very serene looking Danube in Budapest in front of the Parliament building. And the word is next to the heart. It says uh, peace. Uh, so, so this was the biggest win uh, that Hungary that uh, Fidesz has had in 2022. So a lot of uh, people were hoping uh, that uh, the opposition that mostly managed to uh, to band together uh, would have a chance to uh, to beat Fidesz. But in fact, uh, this was uh, the uh, the largest uh, post uh, socialist uh, win for any governing party uh, since uh, 1990. And so you see that uh, uh, the uh, Fidesz won 83 percent of the single member districts, um, and. Uh, <clears throat> 54% on the party list. The, the electoral system is is uh, is somewhat complicated, although there are more complicated ones even in Europe. Uh, and also voters from from the near abroad uh, voted 95% for uh, for the uh, uh, governing party Fidesz. So who who are these pe people from abroad? So this this is worth uh, a, a moment or two. Uh, the Hungarians around, uh, so after World War uh, I, Hungary was dismembered and lost about uh, one third of its population, of one third of a Hungarian, ethnic Hungarian population. And these people still live in the countries around it, mostly in Slovakia, uh, Ukraine, a sm smaller uh, number in the Ukraine, but also in Romania, in Serbia, Croatia, virtually, not virtually, Every single country that uh, is bordering on Hungary has a Hungarian minority, and these people had not been treated well under socialism for historical reasons. Uh, and even after 1990, they have been sort of uh, seriously discriminated against by their by the governments around them, with the stellar uh, exception of Austria and Slovenia. So. Uh, uh, Orban made a big thing, uh, a, a big push to to recognize and help uh, these uh, populations, these ethnic Hungarian populations, arguing that they were more Hungarians than the Hungarians in Hungary proper, since they had uh, suffered uh, uh, for their Hungarianness uh, tremendously, and there is more than an element of truth in this. So he ex uh, so he uh, uh, extended citizenships to all of these uh, ethnic Hungarians. And uh, uh, also they received support from the Hungarian state. And unsurprisingly, 95% of them vote for Fidesz and Orban. Now, I should also say that 
about 240,000 uh, Hungarians left uh, the country since 2010. And these uh, people mostly tend to be intellectuals, well-educated uh, people with transferable skills. And they ended up uh, around the world in Western Europe and North America and uh, uh, made lives for themselves. Uh, they are uh, uh, educated and, uh, and obviously living in the West, in Western democracies, uh, they have a far better understanding of the true nature of the Orban regime. And so they um, they would vote against Orban, but it is made very difficult for them to vote. Uh, so they would have to uh, stand in line at embassies in London and Paris and, and Washington. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> it is much easier for the... Uh, uh, ethnic Hungarians around uh, living in the uh, in Central Europe to vote, they can even mail their ballots in, which is not an option uh, for the uh, Hungarians in the ethnic uh, in the ethnic areas. So, uh, why why is uh, this is the uh, the new parliament in twenty twenty two, and you can see that uh, Orbán Fidesz uh, KDMP, it's a Christian Democratic Party that's basically an alter ego of Fidesz. But the point here is that more than two thirds of the of the uh, of the seats uh, go to or went to went to Fidesz. Uh, so uh, the question is, why do people elect him when when uh, he is uh, he has had such an anti liberal and in many cases you know anti democratic uh, policies? He does remain genuinely popular. So why is why is this the case? And so in the in the remaining uh, minutes of my talk, I'd like to I'd like to speak to that. So remember, there is uh, I already mentioned George Chan. He is the he is the person who was the sort of the the uh, uh, most important socialist politician. What is very important to understand about uh, him. And and uh, I think that a lot of even American uh, uh, analysts miss this that he is essentially behind the opposition. His his name is not on the ballot, but he's uh, he's uh, uh, the head of this democratic coalition that you can see the uh, uh, the name uh, of the coalition behind him. He is its leader. And uh, even though he might not have been the new prime minister had the had the opposition candidate been elected, he would have been standing behind him. And so uh, his wife is uh, now the prime minister of the shadow government, shadow opposition government, uh, who is uh, the uh, daughter of a Bulgarian communist and the granddaughter of, of one of the worst communist henchmen of Hungary from the 1950s, a person whose, uh, you know, the blood of many thousands was on, on his hands. So this is a very small country, and, and all, of, all the people in Hungary know this. So uh, as long as uh, this character is behind the opposition, uh, the chance of, of uh, opposition win is, is very, very small indeed. So um, this him being there is allowing uh, Fidesz uh, after 14 years to still talk about the opposition as this uh, sort of uh, post-communist, uh, uh, incompetent uh, uh, organization. Uh, Gyurcsán is the name of this fellow and Hungarian Ferenc Gyurcsán was, by the way, a communist uh, official, a young communist official in the, the last years of communism. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, Hungarian's minorities abroad. And uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, this is a big deal for many Hungarians uh, uh, in, in Hungary proper and giving them voting rights uh, was something that all Hungarians ag ag agree with. So, so the, the point here is that even though uh, there are a lot of people who disagree with Orban. Uh, there are some issues 
basic issues that cut to the core of Hungarianness that everybody agrees with. You cannot find a person uh, in Hungary who disagrees with helping the uh, Hungarians outside of Hungary's borders. And of course, uh, Orban and his government is smart enough to, to underscore this and emphasize this, that the, he and and this this his party is the one that after you know uh, eighty years of neglect or worse are actually uh, extending a helping hand to uh, Hungarian brothers abroad. Uh, another uh, issue is uh, the Hungary's perspective on on the Ukraine and the war in the Ukraine. So. There is a Hungarian minority in the Ukraine, uh, which uh, has been uh, treated by the Ukrainian government very shabbily as they treated, and uh, I must say this, this is, does not get a lot of play in the United States, but the Ukraine has lots of minorities. Uh, and they are Greeks, Albanians, uh, believe it or not, uh, given the Albanians distance from the Ukraine, but the Romanians, Poles, and they had been very shabbily treated. Uh, by the Ukrainian government. Uh, the, perhaps the best uh, uh, illustration for this is the 2017 language law in the Ukraine, which uh, for all the minorities that until 2017 were able to learn, study in their own languages uh, entirely until the end of their high school years, so grade 12, you could study in Romanian or Polish or, or Hungarian, if you were a member of that uh, ethnic uh, community. After 2017, this language law, which they, at the time the EU very uh, 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 forcefully criticized, uh, ended this uh, at, uh, at grade four. And so basically it was forceful Ukrainiz Ukrainianization of the population, which Hungarians and Romanians and Poles and so on were very uh, upset about. So this is in the background of Hungary's opposition. It's not so much the embracing of the Russian position, but it's uh, it's being more skeptical about uh, helping uh, helping the Ukraine, which of course forcefully conscripting ethnic Hungarians as along with ethnic Romanians and ethnic uh, other uh, groups into uh, into the war. Another uh, issue that every single Hungarian that I'm aware of uh, would agree with is the refusal to allow Muslim migrants to settle in Hungary. Now, the EU doesn't want Hungary to, to, uh, nation, to uh, uh, give uh, uh, refuge to uh, more than a few thousand uh, Muslims, I think, because of Hungary's size, that was the proportion that it was assigned. But... Uh, uh, Hung uh, Hungarians uh, and the, the government uh, has, of course, uh, uh, exaggerated uh, the EU's uh, request to Hungary. And uh, as many of you probably know, Hungary was under Turkish rule for 150 years. And so uh, there are very various uh, uh, comments about we already had uh, Muslims here for 150 years, they devastated the country, which they did. Uh, but also, and this is what Orban is saying, that we didn't survive 40 years or 45 years of communism now to start building mosques. Uh, so whatever you may think of this, uh, Hungarians who are a very traditional conservative society and highly nationalistic, the idea of of uh, of accepting or or creating, as the government said, Muslim ghettos uh, is is an anathema. That just uh, absolutely uh, would not fly. And and Orban and the government uh, uh, receives great uh, support uh, in this. So very conservative uh, society, uh, and and uh, in order to show. To the world that uh, how uh, unpopular these policies would be and how popular the government is, uh, the the Orban government has has spent uh, a great deal of money to to uh, organize what they call as national consultations, which basically people have the uh, the chance to to vote 
or or express their preference for certain policies. And so uh, the most recent was, uh, uh, and I quote, uh, is that 99% per of Hungarians are against uh, creating uh, Muslim ghettos in Hungary. So, uh, yes, I just mentioned this about the national consultations. Again, very conservative society. There is uh, gay rights uh, are uh, are you know giving rights to 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 uh, gays or or uh, uh, lesbians. LGBTQ community is is uh, extremely unpopular, widely unpopular among the vast majority of the of the of the population. So I I got this for you. This. Uh, this uh, uh, these billboards say, let let us uh, protect our children, and uh, on April nineteen, vote uh, uh, vote with a no, which means uh, no LGBTQ rights. But obviously, there are at least some uh, more progressive people because the graffiti uh, that you see underneath is let us. Uh, uh, let us protect our children from Putin, from uh, uh, the propaganda, and from the Russians. So not everyone is uh, in Orban's camp, obviously. So Orban is also is a, he's, uh, is a very appealing personality for, for, most, uh, for most people. He's very well spoken, uh, as some of his predecessors were not unfailingly polite and gentlemanly and this this really plays plays very well in Hungary uh, he doesn't get down to mud wrestle with uh, members of the opposition there obviously he has lots of opportunist pundits that uh, do that for him he's not afraid to make fun of himself uh, he 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 regularly makes fun of his expanding girth um, and he's also a family man. This really plays well. So he 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 married his wife in 1986. Been married for 38 years. Has five children, uh, whom I grown up by now. But also in counter distinction to uh, the opposition leader Durchan, who is on his third marriage and has very sort of unsettled uh, uh, family life. So all of these things make a make an, an, a, an impression on Hungarians. Also, he's, uh, Hungary is soccer crazy, you know, it's crazy about sports in general, but especially about soccer. And uh, uh, Orban himself is, is a genuine uh, soccer fan and was for many years a registered player, not a bad player, at, uh, in fact. So uh, uh, he also built a lot of uh, uh, soccer stadiums, infrastructure, and so on. And so, um, this is a, another uh, reason why he goes and uh, to to soccer matches and and interacts with people, and uh, also helps his person uh, his his popularity. So, the um, Orbán's uh, fourteen years has also been been. Uh, uh, sort of co-terminus with, with increasing prosperity in Hungary. Uh, there is a great deal of, of political stability of this soft authoritarianism, uh, which uh, is uh, quite, uh, you know, a lot of uh, major multinational businesses look, to, look at this favorably. Uh, the EU, uh, with the EU's help, of course, uh, there has been a incredible amount of infrastructural development and it's not uh restricted to you know budapest and uh, some of the touristy towns and areas but every little village in in hungary has has uh been essentially transformed in the last 30 years but especially in the last 14 years and to be sure a lot of this is eu money and uh, corruption is uh, among the among the business and political elites is widespread, but uh, you know let's say they steal twenty percent of the uh, of the EU funds. Uh, it's still eighty percent is making uh, a, a great deal of difference uh, for uh, for uh, Hungarians. So uh, 
somebody just told me that uh, over 100,000 Hungarians, remember in a population of, of, of 10 million, uh, work for American companies in the U in in Hungary alone. Uh, so these are these make massive massive differences. Um, now my last slide says that uh, most Hungarians don't understand democracy. This is uh, uh, as you can figure out, I'm sure is all I want for Christmas is 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 democracy, democratia. Uh, <clears throat> Hungary did not have democracy ever prior to 1990. So none of the East European countries with the uh, the signal uh, exception of the Czech of Czechoslovakia, which in the interwar period between the two world wars uh, was uh, did have uh, a functioning democracy with all political parties allowed to uh, allowed to exist. Uh, none of the other East European countries had. So when uh, when you talk to uh, Hungarians, and there are a lot of uh, uh, polls, other than sort of the intellectual elites, the the idea that uh, uh, there should be free and fair elections, even for, even for political parties that one disagrees with, uh, is kind of lost on, on many of the people. So uh, it is not, it does not have the, the uh, the uh, sort of a West European liberal democracies uh, kind of support base, uh, even uh, 30, 34 years or 35 years now after the fall of, uh, fall of communism. So uh, I think it's, it's one of the reasons uh, for why uh, Orban had such a sort of fertile ground and his and his party to exist. And so what I try to do is uh, what uh, kind of outlined what he did and then why he is still very popular because he is genuinely popular. And uh, I'm absolutely certain that if it were a fair election, it is not, if it were a free and fair electoral system, uh, even with full media uh, balance for, for all political parties, uh, Orban would still be elected. So I'm going to leave it here and let uh, Dave Forsyth take it away. Okay. Uh, Dave, do you have any comments or do you want to go to the chat? Um, can you hear me? All right. Yes. Okay. Uh well, we we should. Uh, I know that Marvin Al uh, Marvin has a uh, uh, question. I I would just note that just very recently, there's been a scandal that has erupted in Hungary, um, not so much involving Orban, but the president and some people around the president about uh, uh, covering up a sex scandal or allowing some people out on parole. So my question would be to uh, Zoltan, uh, does this sort of late breaking scandal uh, present a real threat to the ruling regime or are they so well uh, established and controlling everything that this new scandal won't make any difference? Well, the, uh, so, so it 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 was a scandal, uh, and and the what happened was that the the president of the of the republic, uh, obviously also a Fidesz uh, politician, by uh, uh, Katalin Novak, a very highly regarded and popular woman, uh, she basically signed or commuted the sentence of a child molester or something along those lines. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, this was uh, uh, discovered by the opposition and uh, very promptly the president resigned. Uh, so she stepped down uh, and so did the uh, the minister of justice. So neither of these people, I mean, they were just essentially didn't really do their due diligence or their advisors didn't do their diligence, but they, uh, they, uh, they resigned and... Uh, and I think that uh, Orban 
uh, in the in a press conference uh, yesterday or two days ago, he made much of it that there is accountability in his regime and people who make mistakes will pay for their mistakes. And so there was a... Uh, a demonstration that the it was not the opposition. Very importantly, it wasn't the opposition who put this demonstration together or who organized it, but it all happened on social media by influencers. Uh, that is uh, sort of uh, a popular culture people who uh, called attention to this and on on social media organized this large demonstration, uh, which mo uh, mobilized uh, a few tens of thousands of people. But uh, this is the difference uh, uh, on sort of a partial autocracy like Hungary uh, and a full autocracy like Russia. So nobody bothers the you know people. They you know the traffic is duly uh, 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 rerouted, and they were allowed to sort of vent their uh, uh, frustration with the government and and whether it will have any kind of. Uh, Aftermath, uh, I am, I am doubtful. So, so basically, the bottom line is to your question, Dave, is that uh, even this this candle broke, and the government tried to uh, turn it into his into its own advantage by pointing out how there is accountability because uh, the uh, the head of state just immediately resigned. There wasn't any you know, back and forth, or nobody had to force her. She just tendered her resignation the next day. Um, Bob, do you want to read the questions from the chat? Sure, sure. I've got those compiled here. So we'll start with the first one for Dr. Barani. Uh, you mentioned the state-dominated media. What access would normal Hungarians have to Western media sources, CNN, BBC, VOA, and the Internet? Mm -hmm. No, very good question. So they they have absolutely full internet uh, access. The problem is that so very few people, uh, well, very few people over a certain age would speak, you know, or or know a language well enough to to read, you know, in English or German, right? Now this would this would not be a problem for people under forty. Uh, so they they actually have. Uh, uh, internet access is is not a problem. I think it's just most people are uh, just or you know just not really interested in in uh, sort of trying to find out what's going on or what is thought of their uh, what is thought of their uh, of their government. But if you know if any of you go to Hungary and you get on the internet, you can you know you can you have access to the internet like you would have in the United States. The next question is, is the perimeter militarized to discourage migration? Okay, yeah. So uh, so there is a major uh, presence uh, of, the, uh, of the border guards around the southern borders, especially. So the border, particularly with Serbia, uh, where uh, migrants uh, in the last uh, several years would come through, and uh, uh, it's not, it's not. I don't think there are actual military forces, but there are certainly, you know, border guards, sort of uh, paramilitary forces there. And uh, uh, I don't think that uh, it. Hungary doesn't have, of course, a, a, a maritime border, so getting into Hungary is only uh, through land, and uh, and. Uh, People, uh, obviously, the migrants have understood that uh, they would not be uh, welcomed. So, so it. Uh, I think in the last couple, last two or three years, it hasn't been uh, a major issue. Uh, people just uh, would be uh, would not come through. I should also mention, by the way, that Hungary does have uh, sort of a migrant or not migrant immigrant communities. So there, there are uh, small, but you know, several thousand. Uh, uh, strong communities from the People's Republic of China. There's some Vietnamese uh, people and uh, uh, also a large contingent of Ukrainians, something uh, to the order of uh, 50 or 80,000 have moved in. Most of these are ethnic uh, Hungarians to be sure, but uh, 
but uh, there are also some Ukrainians. What what the Hungarian government is very keen on, and, and actually it's very, uh, uh, how should I put it? Um, so it makes a very clear distinction that uh, as long as you're Christian, uh, we might work with you as a refugee because they have a labor shortage on, and and uh, so it's not that uh, uh, people who, who come through would not have uh, uh, some sort of livelihood, but they are very uh, uh, specifically against any Muslim uh, Muslim incursion into Hungary. Our next question is, what are the top five American companies in Hungary? Hmm. Well, Apple, I'm sure. <laughs> Everybody seems to have an, an iPhone. Um, so uh, car companies are not doing uh, so well because of... Um, although you do see, uh, I was there in, in uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I, my mother is still in, in Budapest. And so I see her twice a year. Uh, so I saw a lot of Ford Mustangs for some reason, even new ones. So Ford must have a, a, a IBM, I think, high tech firms. Uh, also, the uh, Hungarian agriculture is uh, is pretty well developed, and and uh, I think that uh, farmers definitely have a, a preference for American farm equipment, particularly John Deere. Is like, if uh, I think that. There is a consensus if if you can afford uh, John Deere equipment, uh, uh, that's what you'll have. But uh, I think high tech companies generally would have uh, a pretty large large presence. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up, what are the prospects for a better political opposition? Well, uh, I think. Honestly, at, at this point, it is it is hard to see. So I mean, Orban is sixty one years old. The opposition is 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 very fragmented, which I'm sure that the the Orban government and uh, and its uh, cronies are are uh, working to fragment them even even more. But uh, they don't. They disagree on uh, the opposition uh, forces disagree on uh, a lot of things that would be key to. Uh, uh, so, so it's hard for them to to uh, come up with a united front. I mentioned that the personality of Dur Chan, who is uh, of of uh, similar age to to Orban, as long as he's in the background, I think that it's uh, it's basically hopeless for the opposition, and and it's poorly organized, uh, and uh, it's not good. So I don't think I cannot foresee. Uh, like certainly the next election, which will be in two years, I would be shocked if if Orban would not be reelected. Why is Orban such a target of U.S. propaganda with respect to democracy versus autocracy? Hmm, that's a good question. Why? Why him? Well, he has. Um, he has uh, uh, been very. Uh, Sort of critical of the United States, uh, the, I should say, very critical of the liberal uh, uh, political uh, sphere of the United States. He has been extremely uh, friendly with uh, uh, former President Trump. Uh, he has been very friendly with uh, with some uh, GOP politicians and pundits and so on. So if you go on. Uh, if you just Google this, uh, Orban and uh, American uh, Republican uh, uh, Party personalities, you will have many, many hits. Uh, I think uh, uh, Trump uh, repeatedly refers to him as someone who, who uh, uh, whom he admires, and I think it's mutual. Orban is definitely hoping for uh, a Trump uh, uh, presidency again. Uh, he has had very good relations with American ambassadors uh, during the Trump uh, presidency and, and very sort of uh, fraught relations with uh, like the current ambassador, who is, you know, uh, obviously a, a Biden appointee. Um, I think that he uh, he is in, in, a, in a sense, he he represents this. Uh, 
sort of a very intelligent uh, uh, way of opposing liberal democracy. That it's uh, that liberal democracy, it's uh, with its tremendous um, uh, current emphasis on LGBTQ movements. Uh, you know, the diversity, you know, inclusion and also you would not find any of this in, in Hungarian uh, universities, for instance. Uh, so um, he's, he also, I don't think he is, um, well, he used to be, he used to have a reputation of being anti-Semitic, particularly because of his, uh, of his uh, personal animus, it seems, uh, against uh, George Soros. Uh, who happens to be uh, uh, Jewish, but uh, but I don't think uh, it's about um, it's about uh, Soros Soros's ethnic background. It is really uh, uh, he believes that uh, Soros has uh, done a lot of uh, uh, disservice to these societies by pushing these agendas. You know the the liberal agenda. Um, he actually has uh, or, uh, Orban and and Hungary in general has very good relations with Israel. Uh, uh, Orban and Netanyahu, perhaps uh, unsurprisingly, seem to have a close relationship. But uh, but uh, I wouldn't say that uh, anti-Semitism, which of course is a legacy in Hungary and many of the Central European countries or European countries in general, is not a major issue in Hungary at all. In fact. Uh, a lot of Israeli citizens uh, uh, move to Hungary for retirement. Uh, so I, I'd leave it at that. What is the nature of Hungary's relations, both political and economic, with China? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so this is, um, uh, this is uh, increasing. China is very keen on, uh, of course, the sort of the market opportunities that Hungary uh, offers them. There are Chinese, uh, you know, ch already Chinese businesses in Hungary. You can, uh, um, you can see Chinese uh, cars, uh, more and more of them in, in, on Hungarian roads. The China is, uh, I think, building a new university uh, in Hungary, which anyone who has any understanding of higher education uh, or liberal higher education is uh, sort of uh, 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 is skeptical about, particularly because perhaps the best university that Hungary had, as I mentioned, the Central European University that Soros uh, established was uh, was kicked out, or the social science departments were kicked out of Hungary. Uh, it's uh, obviously, hung, you know, Hungary is a tiny country for China, a tiny market, but. Uh, but the Chinese are uh, making investments into hung in Hungary and uh, and have sort of a cordial uh, political relationship. I wouldn't say it's the you know it's the closest relationship that uh, that uh, Orban has um, uh, among autocrats. Unfortunately, that uh, that uh, distinction would seem to go to Putin now. But uh, but it's definitely a sort of a friendly relationship with. Uh, with uh, growing economic uh, cooperation between the two countries. This next question, I believe, is in reference to your answer about migration. How many of those Ukrainian migrants were women? Oh, probably uh, the majority were women, uh, because uh, sort of you know, as as you may know, you you cannot leave the Ukraine if you're a male between eighteen and sixty, uh, age eighteen and sixty. So. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> a lot of Ukrainian families uh, uh, were, uh, uh, you know, partied then the, the the mothers and and grandmothers would take the children and grandchildren to uh, to foreign countries. Millions of them, and Hungary uh, certainly has not been uh, 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 host to more than I would say. I heard the the number one hundred thousand, but I think it probably is exaggerated. Certainly, Poland would would be far more hospitable to them, partly because of linguistic reasons. Ukrainian and Polish are much much closer. Hungary is, of course, not a Slavic language, but I think a lot of these people, the ones who stay for the long haul, are ethnic Hungarians who are welcomed and supported by the government. 
How can Orban be so cozy with Putin given Russia's domination of Hungary during the Cold War? Well, this is, you know, uh, sort of the most difficult, most difficult uh, question to answer. So, um, uh, Orban himself, uh, and remember, I started the talk with uh, uh, his his 1989 speech uh, demanding that the Russians leave the or the Soviet troops leave the country. He says that uh, it's important to be. Uh, friendly with the uh, with Russia because the Hungary Hungary is reliant on on Russian energy, uh, oil and gas, and uh, being basically I think he's selling this that uh, uh, that he's being smart and kind of using uh, uh, his uh, good relations with Russia or or, or uh, developing his good relations with Putin in order to receive a preferential treatment in uh, in uh, in in trade with uh, with Russia i think that's that can be the only possibility because uh, hungarians even though i mean this this is something that uh, when you go to hungary people don't like to talk about right uh, uh, and and it's it seems to them this is there was a there was a hungarian saying uh, a proverb that uh, nobody hates the, you know, it's something I'm, I cannot translate it, uh, you know, flippantly enough, but it's basically nobody hates Hungarians more, uh, Russians more than the Hungarians with the possible exception of Poles. Uh, and so uh, Poland and Hungary has had this very close historical relationship. And now even in that relationship, there is there are some discordant voices primarily because the Poles cannot fathom why Hungary is cozying up to the Russians, whom uh, they, of course, uh, uh, continue to uh, to loathe on, on, for many, many reasons. So this is, it, it, it's, I think the only way that you can explain it uh, is, uh, is, you know, what Orban says, that, that he's doing this for trade purposes. But he, I think he believes in strong men. He, he just believes that... Uh, uh, liberal democracy has a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, sort of disadvantages uh, for for countries, especially countries with traditional traditionalist and and conservative and nationalist populations. Has a strict internal security police force been created to process opponents without due process and justice? No, so that's not that's not this. It's certainly not like uh, Russia at all. So I mean, people people are able to go and demonstrate and so on. They, I don't think there are any. I'm, I'm I'm almost certain that there are no political prisoners. Uh, I think so. It's not like so. Uh, as as uh, I'm sure all of your audience knows that you know a Soviet or, or Russian journalists who who are uh, continually and uh, keep writing nasty things about Putin tend to die, right? So no Hungarian journalist has ever been killed. Uh, they just uh, make their lives, you know, very difficult. So they are fired from editorial uh, staffs or, you know, lose their jobs or or they're just, their lives are unpleasant. And so they, they tend to either leave the country, many of them, you know, 240,000, as I mentioned, people left. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, sort of police brutality uh, against political opposition, it's not, it's unknown to me anyway. Mm -hmm. This question asks, I'm in touch with two former tenured faculty members at Nebraska who returned to live their later years in Hungary. They have divergent political views. The one who is pro-Orban expresses that openly in his emails. The one who is opposed to Orban is very reluctant to voice these views in his messages. When I was there a few years ago, I met him and he was still cautious in speaking to me in public places. Is there a suppression of dissident opinions? Well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm surprised to hear it because, uh, uh, so like I said, I, I, you know, from my personal experience, I go uh, twice a year. To Hungary and uh, and uh, you know in restaurants and so on, which I assume that the, the, your listener is referring to, 
and uh, we have occasionally heated debates and nobody ever you know nobody no i i don't i don't see uh, maybe that's a sort of overly cautious uh, behavior on uh, on the part of uh, of uh, your your listener's friend uh, no i think people are perfectly uh, have you know perfectly free to express their views uh, you know, even you know, I mean, you can go out and demonstrate and 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 hold uh, anti-Orban uh, uh, signs, and, and nobody's going to uh, nobody's going to be roughing you up or anything. So it might be that the secret police will, if um, this is entirely conjecture on my part, takes a picture of you, and if you if you want uh, want to have uh, government employment or something, that might. You know, might somehow make uh, the picture uh, or the the photograph uh, the way into the uh, human resources pool, but uh, I I I don't see the I don't see this uh, to be honest. Is the current nationalism connected to any of the history of Hungary between World War One and World War Two? Oh sure, yes, absolutely. So Hungarians definitely. Uh, uh, these countries, uh, not just Hungary, but I, I used to teach East European politics here at the University of Texas, and and I remember telling them uh, about uh, the, Hung the the historical memory of people in 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 Hungary, but in Serbia under Milosevic and so on. Uh, the, uh, Hungarian history is taken very seriously by people, and and you know when you kind of smile about it and. and you were told that, well, you know, the the way for Hungarians to have survived after, you know, Tartar invasion and 150 years of uh, of uh, Turkish rule from 1526 to 1686, and then and then the Habsburgs and and of course the the extremely uh, extremely uh, devastating Soviet occupation for 45 years is to have you know a strong national identity. So very strong national identity, uh, highly nationalistic. Um, basically, I mean, it, it's easy to see uh, even in, in uh, sort of the, the sports uh, newspapers, like everything that's Hungarian is, is, uh, is uh, sort of put uh, front and center. Um, but uh, sort of historical traumas uh, after World War I, uh, when, as I mentioned earlier, I alluded to how Hungary was uh, dismembered and millions of it of ethnic Hungarians ended up elsewhere. So that's that's continually uh, uh, on the uh, so on the agenda. If uh, can I get the uh, for a second the uh, the PowerPoint that I have? How would I do that? Uh, um, yeah, uh, let's get to that up. I think I can get you. Can you share your screen one more time? I'll give you that option. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, I just want to, because it's so relevant to, yeah, right here. So, so relevant to what I, what I'm talking about. So here is Orban. And well, I'll just take my word for it that, uh, that uh, on his, uh, on his scarf, that's historical Hungary, right? That's not the, uh, I, if, I hope you see what I'm what I'm referring to on the scarf, the bottom part of the scarf. It's not Hungary's uh, uh, borders as they are today. That's Hungary's borders at the end of World War, uh, at just before World War One, and so that includes, for instance, all of Slovakia, most of Transylvania, a large part of uh, Croatia, and so on and so forth. By the way, this very picture. And so I can get off it. Uh, this very picture was the source of some uh, heated uh, criticism of Orban from the countries around Hungary. But the point is that this um, old, uh, uh, there is a saying uh, that's still being said after over 100 years, uh, you know, World War I has been over for 106 years, but, the, um, but it's uh, translated from Hungarian, it says, uh, all of our whole, the whole of Hungary is heaven. The uh, uh, part of Hungary is not a country, basically. So 
you know, they, yeah, that's this sort of nationalist uh, 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 feelings is is very strong. Not, I wouldn't say, and you know, older generations probably more than younger generations, but but even younger generations uh, uh, are quite aware of history and. And you know there is this, uh, especially after 1990, this uh, sort of new movement to go and visit uh, Transylvanian villages that are, you know, Hungarian villages or, or in northern Serbia and so on and so forth. You know, we promised everybody that we would end at 8:30. Professor Barani uh, is only committed for these 90 minutes too. So I know there's another question. And it's uh, being asked by a friend of mine, so he'll understand why we're not letting it uh, be asked. But uh, we want to certainly thank you, Professor Barani, for this uh, fascinating and very clear explanation of how Hungary came to uh, put democracy aside and evolve into an authoritarian rule uh, under uh, Viktor Orban. Uh, your, your presentation was was right on point. I know you've spoken to a group of us in Lincoln before, uh, but we appreciate your, your preparation, your slides, and your presentation. So uh, with that, uh, we'll, we'll thank you again, and we'll see everyone else next week on the same website. And uh, we'll be talking um, about Brazil next week. Thank you. Thank you.